fix share my screen. Here we go. Is that sharing now? Yeah, that's fantastic. Thanks. Thanks, Laura. Great. Thank you very much. So as Chan said, my name's Laura. I'm a senior research fellow in health system science at the George Institute, as well as at Imperial College in London. And I've recently moved to Australia from the UK. So the majority of my experience in priority setting has really been within a UK national health service uh, context. And I've also done a lot of work with developing countries in this context too. So particularly in India, where I worked very closely with the government of India to establish a novel system for health technology assessment, now called HTA India, to improve the efficiency and value for money of healthcare decision making in that country. So I come with a varied context and experience. Uh, and I hope to learn from some of you on the call today about your own experiences or context in this uh, particular paradigm as well. So I'm going to talk to you today about priority setting and how that relates to universal health coverage. And then one particular framework that is often applied to the priority setting process called the accountability for reasonableness framework. So I'm aware that those of you that have attended multiple sessions today will have heard a lot about pharmacoeconomic research and health technology assessment. And in this last session, I'm really going to bring it back to why we need health economics at all, why we do this kind of research, and how it ultimately can lead to better decisions, better policies, and better health. So I start by going right back to the Sustainable Development Goals. So these are 17 goals set by the United Nations of which goal number three particularly relates to health. Each of these goals has sub goals and goal number 3.8 is specifically related to the achievement of universal health coverage, which means that every country aspiring towards these goals looks to provide their population with financial risk protection and access to quality, safe uh, and essential healthcare services, medicines and vaccines. So as I've said, the goal of UHC is really to ensure that all people everywhere can obtain the health services that they need without suffering financial hardship in doing so. We know that unfortunately accessing health services is one of the primary determinants of people falling below poverty line in a number of countries, both uh, developing and more developed such as the USA. So the achievement of UHC requires really four key components a strong, efficient and well-run health system, a system for financing health services, access to those essential medicines, technologies, key knowledge, as well as a sufficient capacity of well-trained and motivated health workers. So in order to achieve universal health coverage, there necessarily needs to be some balancing between the demands and the resources available. So this is a schematic developed by the WHO some time ago that I think really demonstrates this quite nicely. In the white box, you can see that if all resources were able to meet, to meet all demands, that white box would be completely blue. However, in the real world, no matter which country you are in, there is always infinite demands upon finite resources. And therefore, balancing or trade-offs must be made. So the blue box represents those funds that are available to provide for health services. And there are three dimensions one must consider when moving towards a UHC oriented system. Those are which costs are covered, which services are covered, and who is covered by that publicly provided uh, healthcare resource. So in the UK, for example, under the National Health Service, we are very lucky that all costs that accessing health services are covered by the NHS. All services are covered with the exclusion of dental care, which is a small fee, as well as prescription costs, which to the ground no one can pay to but they do prescription regardless of the actual cost of their pharmacy. So no. Laura, um, we're just getting uh, your 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 um your microphone's probably just slightly 
um, off. Maybe. Um, if I am close. Yes. Perfect. That's... Yes. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks very much. Uh, so the services covered are all of those services under the NHS, both primary, secondary and tertiary care. And the population covered is the entire population. However, when we compare this to a system such as that in place in India, for example, where they launched the first national uh, health assurance scheme, RSVY, which was more recently replaced in 2020 by uh, what's now called ABPMJ or Modi Care, all costs for specific services are covered. However, notably pharmaceuticals are not covered, certain diagnostics are not covered, and also ongoing management and care are not covered. The services covered are only those incurred within a, tertiary, a secondary or tertiary care setting. So primary care is not covered, and that can lead to a lot of problems later down the line when certain conditions and diseases aren't picked up early enough and the costs are only covered once they become very problematic to manage. And the population that is covered was originally those below poverty line and that has been slightly expanded to those just very uh, slightly above that poverty line who are counted as being under what they call the informal sector. So there are different ways in which countries balance these three dimensions in order to move towards a UHC system. So as I've said, there are finite resources available to account for infinite demands on a health service. And therein lies why we require priority setting. So I've taken here the NHS Confederation statement as well as the rationale from the UK around why priority setting allows the achievement of robust and fair resource allocation decisions. So you can see on the left here that having a fair priority setting process improves overall health and well-being, is more ethical, uh, increases public and patient confidence in the system, helps achieve a financial balance and value for money, and reduces the risk of successful legal challenge, which is a particular problem in a number of countries, but most notably in Latin America. You can also see the statement here, which says that the challenge lies in arriving at a fair process that balances competing needs. One must be aware of the different consequences or opportunity costs of making those investment decisions. So this comes back really to the understanding that every dollar or pound can only be spent once. And when governments choose to set priorities in which they invest that money in a certain condition or intervention, they are inadvertently deciding not to spend that money on another condition or intervention. And therefore, we really need a very uh, technologically robust, fair and evidence-based priority setting process to ensure that in the decisions that we make and the priorities that we set, we're getting the best bang for our buck, or best value for money, maximizing the health gains of those uh, financial resources invested. So as I've said, priority setting relates to the task of determining the priority to be assigned to a service uh, or development of an individual patient or group and uh, at a given point in time. And prioritization is needed because the claims on healthcare resources are always greater than the resources available. So decision makers have to engage in these tough trade-offs and choices on a daily basis. And they can do this either implicitly, which often means using services like uh, wait lists or the first in best dress principle, where if you get up very, very early in the morning and queue at your local hospital, perhaps you will get the service you require. And if you're back at the queue, you won't. There are also these kind of implicit priority setting processes in place, particularly in services that have a strong, countries that have a strong private sector where perhaps you can provide a financial incentive to clinicians to see you. So these are all ways that markets implicitly engage in these trade-offs. Or a more evidence-based and appropriate mechanism is explicit priority setting. And this is where a transparent uh, mechanism such as economic evaluation or health technology assessment are linked to decision-making and institutional frameworks. And this is in place in Australia through a number of bodies, such as the PBSC, 
or in the UK through bodies such as NICE. So this diagram really just represents a schematic of that explicit priority setting process. So you can see at the top there a diverse range of stakeholders who have a say or a stake in the decisions that are made. And those represent both the beneficiaries of healthcare, the community, the health sector that provides healthcare, as well as those policymakers who are making decisions around which healthcare is to be provided and how. And then the non-health sector who are also important in terms of uh, data, for example, of quality control, of governance, regulation and monitoring. Those stakeholders come together and agree on a certain set of defined evaluation criteria for informing priority study. So a range of information goes into that, as you can see demonstrated on the left. So it's health and disease related information, service delivery evaluation, user needs and preferences, and cost effectiveness assessment. This information is synthesized and analyzed. Existing and emerging health needs are uh, provided or produced, and then these in turn inform a prioritization exercise in which priority needs and interventions are ranked according to what can and cannot be funded at that given point in time. And underpinning all of this is a transparent and participatory process. So this is really what it means when we talk about best practice for accountable and transparent priority setting. One framework that is commonly used to guide explicit priority setting is the accountability for reasonableness, for reasonableness framework. So this framework is very simple. It recognizes again, that there are infinite demands upon finite resources and that all those stakeholders, so that be clinicians, patients, public uh, health regulators, providers and decision makers, require transparency and accountability to ensure that they buy into reasonableness of the decisions that are made, i.e. they can be confident the decisions are not only being made on the basis of the bottom line or budget. Different people and parties have different priorities and hence again why there is a requirement for a fair process that takes into account those varying needs and priorities. The key elements of a fair process involve transparency of outgrounds for decision. There needs to be a, a reasonable process for appeal and the incorporation of new information as it comes to light and procedures for revising decisions in light of those challenges. And together, these principles come together to assure an accountability for reasonableness in decision making. So this framework is very simple. It really has three key principles and one that overarches or supports those three. And the principles are this, relevance, which dictates that rationale for priority setting decisions must rest on reasons that stakeholders can agree on, which are relevant in the context. Publicity, which dictates that priority setting decisions and their rationales must be publicly accessible. Revisions, which dictates that there must be a mechanism for challenge, including the opportunity for revising decisions in light of stakeholder considerations that may arise. And finally, enforcement and leadership, which dictates that leaders in each context are responsible for ensuring that these first three conditions of relevance, publicity and revisions are met within their context. So this is where we come to the practical scenario. So I have outlined here an exercise, which I will also share in the chat. So I believe that Tam, we are going to split the group up into two, is that correct? Yes, I think we've probably got um, enough here for two groups. Okay, great. So I'll go through this uh, scenario and then I will post a copy of the uh, exercise in the chat and then I'll move in between the Zoom rooms to facilitate discussion with people in those groups. But what we'll be doing is considering the accountability for reasonable framework and applying that within a given context. 
So here I've imagined you to, I've asked you to imagine you are part of a government advisory committee tasked with prioritizing the quarterly budget to inform spending decisions. Five interventions have been highlighted as requiring consideration and uh, prioritization in order to decide which of those will be included in the public health insurance scheme. So you need to engage with your peers in a priority setting exercise, applying the accountability for reasonable framework. The five interventions I've set out for you, and I would like you to note some particular characteristics of these interventions. For example, some are preventative, some are curative, some are both. Some are uh, for adults, others for children. Some have quite a high unit cost and others low. And I also have provided information on the far right column around the incremental cost effectiveness ratio. So I recognize that we have a defined threshold value. It's difficult to discern exactly what constitutes cost effective and what does not, but I include this information here for comparative purposes. So in your groups, perhaps first individually, I'd like you to think about these interventions and rank them one to five in terms of what you believe is most important to least important to include in the benefits package. Once you've thought about that yourself, I'd like you to come together as a group and compare your decisions. And usually what we find is that the same decisions are by no means made by each individual. As you can imagine, each one of you in the group will have a different background and different priorities. You may also like to play somewhat devil's advocate and pretend that you are coming from a different perspective than your own. And that is perfectly okay and encouraged. And then I'd like you to talk through these key questions. Who should be involved in this process? How can stakeholders be actively engaged and their voice heard? When I talk about who, I'm not just talking about policymakers and academics, but industry bodies, for example. Should big tobacco be included as a stakeholder in the priority setting process that includes interventions for lung cancer, for example, or should they be excluded? Should patients themselves be given a seat at the table? Healthcare providers, charities, really think about who are the key stakeholders that should be uh, part of this process, which factors are important to consider, and you may note that what you consider most important, your peers do not. Which perceptions of factors change depending on individual priorities? How different priorities can be considered and appropriately weighed within the one prioritization process? Whether there's information that could be provided that might change your decision? And how governments can ensure that priorities are implemented? So at the end of this discussion, I want you to come up with a team and agreed list of five interventions, all ranked in exactly the same way. So I will post that in the chat now, and then you will be divided into your priorities that easy. It's by no means uh, something that there is a one-stop shop guidance on this is how you do it and this is how it must be. And that's why we need processes like accountability for reasonableness within a wider context of information to guide these kinds of decisions. Because no matter how good your cost effectiveness analysis is, there are other factors at play that influence that policy decision. And this framework can be applied at multiple levels. So it can be applied at your local community center about how they spend their money for you know, community services. It can be applied at local hospitals. It can be applied at the state level or at national level. So it really allows a, a level of flexibility that can be applied in a number of different contexts. And it really just provides core 